online destroys us anyway. It doesn't matter where the hell you are now. I couldn't sleep. My, I would close my eyes and all I would see is the slot machines playing in my eyelids. I, I knew I was out of control. It's probably good to say that in terms of services that are out there and that are just for women, there's currently li very little. I soon realized that by sharing my story and volunteering, I could help others. And I, I like that feeling, that, that felt good to me. Hello and welcome to the Invisible Addiction podcast. If you're a new listener, hi, thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode. And of course, if you're a long time listener of the podcast, I hope you've been keeping well. Shortly, we'll be hearing a gambling addiction story. And around the midway point, we'll be hearing from Liz Riley, who works for the charity Bet No More UK, and Jean Maleri, who works for the Peer Aid Service. But before we go any further, I'd like to make a short disclaimer and say that this is an informational podcast. If you're experiencing gambling problems, of course, I hope you relate to the stories you hear. That's what this podcast is all about. But please do seek professional help. Links to that support can be found on the Invisible Addiction website, www.theinvisibleaddiction.com forward slash support. Right. Without further ado, let's crack on with the podcast. Okay, so joining us on the other end of the line today is Bobby Malatesta, all the way from across the pond in New York, America. She is nearly four years free from gambling and has come onto the podcast to discuss more about her gambling addiction story and her wonderful podcast, 321 No Kidding. It gives me great pleasure to introduce her. Bobby, thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? Hey, Alex, thank you for having me. I feel like my introductions are so amateur after that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good i mean just just for the listeners benefit we've uh we've just we've done another podcast haven't we just a moment ago um we've we've done a kind of podcast swap so um uh well my, my podcasts are usually notorious for being really bad and unstructured so um i'm like i've got to write a script so um we don't need structure. <laughs> we don't need structure. And you did an amazing job on my show, by the way. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, uh, yeah, well, look, we're going to obviously dive into your story today, your, your gambling addiction story, if we may. Um, but before we do, could you maybe give the listeners just a brief background and experience? Uh, sorry, a brief bit about your background and experience, you know, kind of life experience, you know, what you know, what you kind of do. Absolutely. So I was born and raised in Connecticut, which is the state over, and my, my folks still live there. Um, I've kind of always been a vagabond. In my early 20s, I was, well, grocery store and vagabond. Um, I did a, I was a floral, floral manager, floral category manager, floral director. That was kind of my passion in grocery. But in my early 20s, I was a truck driver, an over-the-road truck driver, and um got to every state except for one and in wow. the, yeah, I got to go back. I'm going to buy an RV and I'm going to go back uh, <laughs> to make nice, sure. I nice. Get it. nice. Um, so I, I did that in my early twenties. I got married around 30. I think it was 30. I thought I was old enough to have had it all figured out, which, Oh, by the way, nope, didn't work out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but didn't go back to college till I was an adult learner and all that. And that was part of my transition. And then I went back, I moved to Kansas City for a while, which was amazing, and I love it there. And gambling actually led me back to upstate New York, and I, I went back to my corporate job and just left in September when the universe delivered me a second business to open, actually, unexpected. So now I have an international virtual assistant business based out of the Philippines. That's so and, cool. Uh, still work on my gambling mission stuff in the background amazing amazing um by the way what, what what's uh, the one state that you've not ticked off which which state is that well here's the problem when i was learning how to drive there was an instructor that said he had missed either i think he missed south dakota but i could never remember it so when i was driving back then i think i drove through south dakota so i wouldn't miss it but then i never met went to North Dakota because they're stacked on top of each other and you could go uh, either way. So I'm missing one of the Dakotas, but I can't swear to it. So I'll have to go to both. There we go. There we go. That's amazing, by the way. What a story. 
what a story already like you know, the, the the traveling and stuff like that um yeah i mean it's totally different here because over in the uk like we're we're, we're tiny we're, we're we you know we, it only takes us a few hours and we can be at the other end of the country but i guess for you it's like blimey it's like yeah you you know it takes a few hours just to get through a state yeah yes yeah connecticut was a small state where everything's within an hour of each other pretty much and then new york it's not that way at all i mean you can drive you can drive six hours just to get to the next state if we went west of my house so i i enjoyed i enjoyed driving though it was it was wonderful but i think coast to coast is close to three thousand miles wow which i don't know the kilometers i'm sorry <laughs> so so how how would that work would it be like you would just do a whole big route or you would truck drive in a state like how how did that work well when i was over the road they whatever it was they assign a load to you based on where you are to go pick it up so you you'd pick it up and then you drive to wherever it was to get delivered and then from there this the process starts again so i could start maybe in connecticut and end up in indiana and then pick up in indiana and go to texas and then from texas to whatever you know it kind of worked that way i had my favorite load was a cross-country trip i went from new york city to la wow. it was my it was a high value load it was a load of tequila it was worth over a million dollars that was like my oh. favorite load um <laughs> sounds like my dream <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then i got boring after a while and i um I was regional, so then we just we could I could sleep at home some of the nights and sleep at the the yard it's called for lack of a better word next to this the supplier we picked up from. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I mean, I'm I'm for, I'm always one for going off on tangents, and I, I really would love just to spend an hour just speaking about this because it sounds so cool, like you know uh, that life on the road and and um, and things like that. But look, I mean, obviously we'll get into your gambling addiction story. So. So where did it, where did it all begin? Well, for me, I really believe it started in my childhood and I'm a, I'm a believer that arcades are gambling. And I call that out a lot because parents don't think about that. Do you guys have arcades in England? Like yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. So basically you put money in a machine, a ticket comes out, you go get a prize, right? It's not very different than gambling chance or circumstance. So there was that, and then there was penny, dime, nickel, poker we would play. Those are small change um, currencies here. Uh, so it was just part of the culture, family picnics. We would do uh, betting on, oh, I don't think you guys would know the name. It's called Holy Board here, but we bet on anything, really. Scratch off says Christmas presents, right? Like So all that, by, by 18 or 19, I was sneaking into the casino here. I knew how to get in. It was 21, but I knew how to sneak in through a bathroom where there wasn't a security guard. I could never win big because then they would get carded and I'd get thrown out. But um, even as early as like 15, I remember buying lottery tickets and scratch offs. And when I was working in the stores, I used to go up and I'd say, okay, well, give me a book of scratchers. I'll scratch them and say the book costs $500. Give me the book, I'll scratch them. If I win, you'll owe me money above the 500. And if I lose, I'll pay you the difference to the wow. 500. Like, wow. yeah, not so good. Um, but bingo, like you think about going to church bingo with the grandmothers. I mean, it yeah. starts young. Mm -hmm. And um, I can remember being 19, 20 and leaving work and going. We had a sport called high lie. And it's principles of betting is a lot like dog track or horse horse racing, you know, picking on the numbers of the players. It looks like racquetball or squash or something. Uh, bet on that. And then when I was old enough to be in a casino, well, that's where I was. And yeah. even trucking across the country, I knew where all the casinos were. Um, and I would stop at them. When I met my husband after I became a truck driver, so I had had some time alone on the road. But then when he joined me, um, <laughs> He would wake up, not know where the heck I was, and I was inside the casino. Like, I'd walk to casinos, take cabs, and leave him sleeping there. I was a horrible wife. I was really a horrible wife. Um, but he got, he got tired of that. There was, there was one time we, um, there was a riverboat we used to go to, and there's different laws here and in different places, but riverboats have to 
to move on the water to keep their license in some states or however it works. Hmm. So one night we were on and we split ways. He would go to blackjack. I would go to the slots and he's not a compulsive gambler. He just was a good husband and tried to be supportive of me. And once he got in there, he liked it. So this one night we're separate and we run into each other at the bathroom and he's like, we're moving. I was like, what do you mean we're moving? He's like, the boat is moving. Neither one of us had any idea. Other people had told us independent. So we're going down a river. Now with the loads, if we had to leave, like if we lost and had to leave and go back to the truck to start driving, so we wouldn't have been late, we wouldn't have been able to get off the boat. Um, so yeah, uh -huh. I'm a little crazy. So he throws me out of the truck and uh, says, not, not literally, he says, you know, this is a problem. You can't keep gambling. We were making good money as owner operators. He's like, why don't you go home, go back to the supermarket. It'll keep us out of trouble. So the first day after being home, I went to the casino at home hmm. and um, I won a car at Bingo. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I called him up and I said, Hey, I said, do I take the car or the money? I had a choice. Now, mind you, I didn't have a car at the time. So do I take the car or the money? Cause the car was worth say 13,000 and the money was 8,000. And uh, he's like, you're at the bleep bleep casino. And he hung up on me and he ruined the whole experience. That should have been amazing. Um, although it was, it was probably validating that I should be a gambler in the back of my head. Yeah. Um, and even, even when I went to go pick up the car, I had to borrow money to get it insured and to pay the taxes. I was on my way to go pick it up and I still stopped at the casino on the way and gambled with the money to get the car. Luckily I won that day. So I was able to pay back the person I borrowed from, but that's how sick I was when I was gambling. So it's been a while. Yeah. So, so what were you gambling on in the casinos? Obviously you mentioned the, the bingo, but in the casinos, was it at this point, was it just a whole kind of variety of things? It, it definitely was a variety. I'm a slot. I love the slot machines. Um, I got invited to a slot tournament once and I had to spend the night to finish the competition the next day. So I started playing let it ride was one of the ones I investigated. I liked roulette, but again, it was because I would, I was always intimidated by the tables, by all those people and not understanding the rules. Like I never learned how to play craps or anything because I was just I didn't like that much action. I didn't understand. Me too. It. I can relate all of uh, everything you've just said. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I didn't have a clue. Yeah. yeah. But, but slot machines and that freaking bonus round. I mean, that, that was my historical mantra. One more bonus round, please. We can't leave yet. Just one more bonus round. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, um, yeah, as I say, I can totally relate because the whole, the, the poker table thing like really um really intimidated me i didn't have a clue i was like oh that's like proper gambling you know um you know <laughs> well what about i mean i don't know if it took it by storm but about i don't know maybe 20 years ago here texas hold'em really started ramping up like it was on all the tv stations and all the family parties we played texas hold'em tournaments constantly every family get together it became a thing. And then I worked my confidence up to where I was play, playing in the back room of a bar, you know, every weekend, cash games, tournaments, like you get braver and braver as your gambling career goes on, I think. Yeah, for sure. Because how does it work? Because um, in America, I thought it was, was it only legal in, uh, you know, Las Vegas, and I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, is it Kansas City? Was it there? I can't remember. But for casinos, like I always, I had this kind of skewed view that America was almost like quite closed off. It was like we only do betting in casinos, and it's only really Las Vegas. I'm just, I'm being so stereotypical. That's that's literally my view of of things, or what was my view. But it, but it sounds it sounds completely different. Well, you you're right. That's the way it used to be. And there's a couple different things. The states are starting to see it as revenue sources. And here in New York, they have state-run casinos. So they're literally the state owns them and reaps the rewards and all that. But there's also Indian casinos, which I guess I'm not supposed to say Indian anymore. Native American casinos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. And that's a big piece of it throughout the country. So because it's on their property, they can they can do it. But a lot of the, the politics, like there's, um, you can pretty much drive like 
an hour, hit a casino, another hour, hit another casino. Like it's getting saturated because the governments are using it as a revenue stream. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's stuff out there at the moment. Um, I think in America is like kind of legalized or liberalized sports betting. So a lot of us over in the UK, I mean, I'm sounding like a, you know, a worried uncle or whatever, but uh, I'm like, I'm a bit worried about what's going to be going on in the States, it, you know. It just passed in New York in this last year. Yeah, you can go to the casino. Well, I never got into sports betting, but something changed to where you can do the sports betting. You can go to the casino and do it. Um, I don't know how it works because it, it happened since I quit. So I haven't been in. Like one of my girlfriends bet on the Super Bowl last year and she told me a little, but that's about all I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. but online online destroys us anyway. It doesn't matter where the hell you are now. Mm. It's it's a shame, and it's like I yelled at Facebook the other day. If we, if you or I went to go run an ad to promote our gambling addiction recovery podcast, we'd have to be careful of the language saying gambling in it, right? Like Facebook would red flag us as maybe troublemakers or whatever. But in the background on these games, you see these ads where they're talking about they're paying you real cash, win these free games, blah, blah, blah. And those ads are everywhere. Like, it's so frustrating to me. It's, it's too easy. And it, it appeals to the kids and to the people who don't know any better. Oh, it's, it's, oh, it's so worrying. It's, it's just preposterous. Um, I spoke to another chap on, on, on a guest on the podcast, Danny, and he was mentioning about, um, yeah, about this on Facebook, uh, a game that's been downloaded like millions of times. Uh, and it's essentially like a slot machine kind of game. Um, but yeah. kids can play. It's just like, ah, yeah, it's just mad. It's just mad. But look, Bobby, um, I, like I said on your podcast, I'm ever, I'm ever so good at going off on tangents. But um, so if we bring it back to your story and we pick it up, so you've won um this car from the bingo so at this point your husband is you know kind of had a bit of a go at you and 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 such like so at this point are you fully aware that you've got a problem i think i knew for many 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 years before i really acknowledged it in my early 20s i participated in um a gambling study which if you think about that being 26 years ago that's pretty impressive that they were paying attention back then Um, but I had, it was like a six month thing and it was paid, which was interesting, right? Like not a lot of money, but it it was a paid event and I'd have to go to the therapist and some people were given pills and some people were given placebos. Some people had to go to GA, some people didn't, but during the whole exercise, I didn't gamble the six months because I was being watched. So I was like, Oh, I don't have a problem. Like that was my, I'm invincible kind of thing. But for many years, I would go to the casino and people with me would be, everybody thought I was lucky for one thing, but you win more because you bet more, right? So the chances Mm -hmm. of that happening, like they don't know I'm stuffing two or three machines at the same time, not doing it like one with a little, you know, minimum bet, max bet. It needs to be the biggest. It needs, you know, the chase, the hunt. So people would always be like, hey, there's a, there's a 1-800 number. Because here in our casinos, there's um, a lot of signage, not a lot, but there's signage and cards. If you need help, call this 1-800. Like, we actually used to call me a gambleholic before I quit. Okay. Um, with, you know, instead of a, a gambling addict, or they call it compulsive gambler now, mm. you know, the whole politically correct around <laughs> language. Um, but gambleholic is what everybody kind of we used as a word so we knew for a long time wow 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 wow! can you can you tell us a little bit more about that study that's so interesting like you say 26 years ago um you, you know a study that was paid as well so what did that i know you just said you know it's like taking pills or medication or people have to go to g so was it a study to a, a study to study a study to study uh how people respond to giving up gambling I don't know. Yeah. Can you just tell us more? Yeah. Well, that was a long time ago, but I, I, I think the premise was to see what treatments work because mm. I believe I'm, I'm not a doctor and I don't know what I don't know, but I believe that there are some, some medications that help with the, like the neurotransmitters or the, the hormones, um, 
serotonin and dopamine and all that stuff that impact that. So I think those are the medications they were playing with. There's also a lot of medications that make people suicidal or increase their urges to gamble is another thing that's happening. All these depression meds and I can get going on all that. But um, so I think that's what they were, that's what they were studying. Like, do you, does your probability of quitting go up when you go to GA or not, you know, or the therapist or not? So that was kind of the premise of it. So yeah, they were studying quitting, not mm. actually want, you know, like trying to get people to gamble. Mm. That's, it's interesting. It's interesting. So, um, so did you experience a quote unquote, like rock bottom moment? Like where, from, from where you were from winning the car with the bingo, like how long was it? I mean, I don't know if you want to pick up the story from there. So I, I think, I think you said something like this and maybe I have experienced this. You know how there's the term functioning alcoholic? I think I was a functioning gambleholic. I was mm. going to work. I was making the money. I never had a big savings account or any of that stuff. Dave would, we, we would fight about money and gambling, but I still always, I knew how to manipulate him at that point. Um, so I never quit as long as we were married. I would try, I would try to go on breaks, but there was a while, like he was working third shift and I would do the good night call and I would get out of bed and go up to the casino once he thought I was sleeping, but I was really gambling away our household money and stuff, you know? So it escalated, but we, we ended up splitting up. And about a year after we split up, I got my dream job. Like I was going to be director of floral. My goal was to do that by the time I was 40. I did it at 39. I was a cat's meow. That's when I moved to Kansas City. And even I interviewed on June 3rd. I flew out the weekend, two weekends later to start apartment looking. And in order to apartment look, I stayed at a casino because the hotel was cheaper to uh, stay at when I was apartment looking. I get out there, and this was after a few months of not working, which, oh, by the way, time, you want to talk about free time and spending time at the casino? That was pretty much what I did during my whole stint of unemployment. Mm. And um, I move out there the first week of July. This is 2013. And August 16th, I've been there essentially a month. I went to the casino on a Saturday night strolled out Sunday morning sometime. I lost everything. All, every dime I had, the rent money, the cash advances on the credit card. Um, I couldn't sleep. My, I would close my eyes and all I would see is the slot machines playing in my eyelids. I knew I was in trouble. I was like, I'm here by myself because now I'm, I'm divorced. It's only my income. I have no savings account and I have no way to pay all this money the credit card's going to be looking for. So, um, that was the first time I quit and, um, I decided that that morning. Now I have to tell you too, I did not like gamblers anonymous. Like I had, I had an issue with the 12 step programs growing up cause I had to go to Alateen and all this stuff. And I was like, well, why do I have to go to 12 step? It's not my fault. You know, my biological father was an alcoholic or whatever. Like I just had this resentment towards it. Sorry, what's, then, what's Alateen? Is that like um, when you're kids of alcoholics? Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like you're a teenager and you can go and support groups. Sure. Um, so I just, I just had this underlying, I don't want to go to a 12 step program. I hated the, the concept, uh, but I made a decision. I was going to go to Gamblers Anonymous. I had done it during the study. Um, and I remember this was another thing that pissed me off about it. I'm in there and I was trying out for the game show Wheel of Fortune. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I had tried out for it a few times. And when I was in the study, I was going to GA and I was talking about it. And they're like, you can't go try out for Wheel of Fortune as a gambler. And I'm like, why not? It's not my money. Like I had this equation that gambling had to do with just money, right? Like not, I couldn't grasp that. And it still took probably another decade before I did. Um, but I didn't like that. Well, who are these people to tell me what to do? Um, so I'm like, all right, I got to go to GA. So that Sunday morning, I decided I was going to find a second job and I was going to go to GA. And that Monday night was my first GA meeting of true surrender 
like true, I'm going to quit and I'm going to do this. And it lasted, it lasted over two years the first mm -hmm. time. I, and I was really involved in the Gamblers Anonymous community in, in KC and it was great. And should I keep going? With, oh, like, keep going. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. So that was, that was really good. I was like on committees and buying the anniversary cakes and doing all the things. And this is why I believe in the medication part. I don't, I think there's a medicine I'm on that maybe helps. I don't know. It's never been documented, but I don't know if it also is supposed to help me quit smoking. So I go on these waves and I don't know if it was that or stuff, but but whatever, I, I'm at a Renaissance fair. It's, um, it's an October day. So my, my two years was in August, that August of 2015. I'm at this Renaissance fair on this October day. And I never told the casino to stop sending me mail. So when I first quit gambling, they would send me free play and it might've been $25. Well, by the time this day came, it was up to $500 a week. So they were missing me. That was the story that I was hearing. Wow. And I knew about these coupons being home. So I literally, I drove 30 <coughs> minutes to go get the coupons. And then I drove another 30 minutes to go to the casino. And it was, the, nothing specific happened. I was definitely, I was drinking, which mm. definitely didn't help my state of mind. Um, but I went and I relapsed after over two years. Mm. Um, and then I gambled all of 2016 and the rest of 2015 mm -hmm. and i knew I, I knew i was out of control like i don't even remember most of 2016 if i wasn't at the casino i was at the bar um i didn't generally mix alcohol and gambling mostly because casinos were usually somewhat of a drive and i didn't want to drive back because usually i was overtired and whatever mm -hmm. uh, it really had nothing to do with alertness or anything responsible other than just, you know, I might wreck my car. And I was still connected to my Gamblers Anonymous community and they were still my friends and I would still show up at, you know, significant anniversaries or they would have an annual conference. And, oh, that was the most miserable thing was walking in there and having my day one, like, because they did this circle where you did a countdown of time. And I should have been on the side of the room with the three years, but instead I was on the one day because I had just mm. gambled the day before. Uh, that was that was shame at its finest. I, I hated that moment and it really stuck with me. But my at these conferences, they would have people, and, and one of my favorite couples from GA in Kansas City, the husband was in, in Gamblers Anonymous and the wife was in the in Gamnon, he had gone to inpatient treatment in another state. And uh, he's like, Bobby, you should really think about this. And I did, I was thinking about it and I'm like, well, how do I miss, how am I gonna pay for this, right? That's the first obstacle. How, how if I am running up all this debt, how am I gonna pay for this? Well, if you went to a therapist and she signed off on it, you can go to rehab and the state of Kansas would pay for it. They would pay mm -hmm. for treatment. So again, there's these riverboat casinos and they give money back to the state to help fund the treatment, which is part of my big term mission. I want to help change the laws and get that more consistent across the states. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, that's great. They'll pay for it. But how do I miss four weeks of work? I still have to get paid. Mm -hmm. So I go in that January of 2017 and I have my, um, we have to pay for, we have to every year re-enroll in our medical benefits and make choices and sign up and stuff. Well, because I was a director, come to find out I had eight weeks of short-term disability, it's called. So they would pay me for up to eight weeks if I was missing. So now I have the treatment paid for and I'm going to get paid to go to treatment. What other obstacles can I have? Hmm. Well. I had a free cruise that the casino gave me that I had to get out of the way. So, so I was in the mindset, like, I guess most people, when they go to treatment, it's like in this, like in the heat of the rock bottom moment. And that wasn't how it worked for me. I planned it just as if it was like a job function. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'm going to go after the cruise. I'm going to go on the cruise and I'm going to gamble my brains out and have my last drops. It's going to be the last time I gamble. I'm going to do this right. So my mother and her boyfriend invite themselves on my cruise and 
I did. I partied like a rock star and I gambled. I, I gambled day and night and lost a fortune. Never told my mother I was going to treatment until like the fifth day. And then she says, well, are you going for gambling or alcohol? Like that was her first question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so in the background to this, I need money to fix all the debt and all the craziness, right? So a job opens up back here in New York that would pay me more money. <laughs> so I had applied for the job. One of my friends would have been my boss. And she's like, you, you need to put in for this. And I'm like, well, I'm going to treatment. She's like, she didn't understand. She still doesn't understand the value of self-care. But I'm like, listen, if I don't go to treatment, you don't want me working for you. You know, mm -hmm. this is a corporate, you mm -hmm. know, management job. It was a less of a title, but way more money. So we come back from the cruise on March 18th, which was a Saturday. We come home to a freaking blizzard. <coughs> and, and that's in Orlando. So in Florida, we get back from the cruise. I fly into Kansas City that Saturday night. Sunday, I fly to New York to, inter to interview for the job on Monday morning. So I fly back Sunday, Sunday night to New York, go to the casino while I'm here. Um, go to the interview, fly back to Kansas City that Monday. The interview was at 11 in the morning. I was back on a flight Monday night, go back to Kansas City, pack, and I get up the next morning and I drive the eight hours to rehab. That was, wow. uh, yeah. So that casino that I had done, I now live in front of, it's literally in my backyard. <laughs> Um, I did negotiate the job. So when you're in rehab, you're not allowed access to your, well, in this rehab, I, I couldn't have my cell phone. I, it takes 48 hours even to get phone rights. So now I had had the interview, but I wouldn't be able, nobody could contact me to tell me if I got the job. Oh, so and I couldn't go, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't get on email. I'm like begging the counselors. And I told them when I got in, I'm like, listen, I need to find out about this. Um, and luckily my friend was the hiring manager, but HR couldn't call me. So, but I could, once I got my phone privileges, I was like, well, how's it looking? And she's like, well, you need to talk to Yvonne, but it looks good. So they sent me over an offer begging the counselors. Can I please get on the computer, please? Mm -hmm. So I get the offer. I'm trying to negotiate it with no phone and no computer, you know, like the, the yeah. So I get, we finally agree. They hire me. Well, you have to take pre-employment drug testing. Well, the treatment center I was in had drug testing because it was alcohol and drugs on one side and gambling on the other. But you can't tell your about to be employer that you're in rehab. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know no. What I'm yeah. Yeah. So I talked my way out of that and I'm like, I'm traveling, I won't be back to New York. So they got we got that settled. And um, then I had to take hours and hours of testing, pre-employment testing, like the psych testing. So again, another battle with the counselors. I'm in rehab. There's a guy that came in. He has the same clean date as me. I fell in love. Like I literally fell in love at first sight. Never expected it. I was seeing some other guy before I, I left up until this point. Mm -hmm. And I like just, this was the guy. This was the guy. I've never felt that way before. I, just this was the guy. So here we have two fucking gambling. It. No, you swear. You, you swear. You swear ahead. You, that's okay. fine. Yeah. I'm trying to edit myself a little. Um, so we got two addicts. Um, he invites me. I, I'm a little bit ahead of him as far as when I'm going to get out because he had went to a psych ward first. So I'm about a week ahead of him when I'm leaving. And um, I, he invites me to his room the night of my last night there. And I actually know that I love him so much that I wouldn't dare go to his room to risk him getting thrown out. It wouldn't matter to me because I was leaving the next day. I was going to say, is, is this like off limits? Is it, you know, the rehab rules, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like the girls are on one side of the wing and the boys rooms were down here yeah. and you had a, a, a roommate too, but you had a room inside a room. So he walked into a big room and then there was like a little room where the door, so yeah. it could have snuck in if his roommate was asleep, good enough or whatever. But I, I just knew I didn't want to risk it. And oh, by the way, he was married. Um, but they were talking about separating and stuff because of the gambling. So I really didn't, I was like, this guy's not a cheater. And he, you know, like this is, you mm -hmm. could just tell, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
So I, I leave the next day. I didn't go to his room. I leave the next day. Within 15 minutes, I'm like, I want to go back because I like missed him already. Like that was, it was the most insane feeling I've ever felt. And um, I pull over and I'm bawling my eyes out in this car wash. And I like write him this crazy love letter that I have no idea what it says in it to this day. Cause once I sent it, I just have no idea and it's gone. So I get home and I send him the letter and I'm like, confess my whole, like, cause I didn't tell him I was in love. Like we knew, but we, you know what I mean? Like it wasn't a conversation we had. And I send it to him cause I know he's still there in rehab and um, he gets out and we connect and neither of us have gambled since that, our, our clean date. And I'm very passionate about our clean date because it is shared. And um, mm -hmm. I think we just recovered at different paces. And I think that we should have never gotten a relationship in rehab. Like it wasn't intentional, but he added so much value to my life. And I'm so grateful, so grateful to know him. Um, even the hard stuff made me a better person. So I'm not complaining about that at all. Um, obviously we're not together anymore and mm -hmm. he's actually interning. He went to school and he's like a drug and alcohol counselor now, and he's trying to get oh, the word yes. out. He opened a business around gambling addiction and, um, he's a recovery coach as well. So he's working on doing that. So we stay connected now in the recovery space. Um, he was probably one of the best things that ever came out of my addiction. And if I had stayed quit the first time, like I truly believe I relapsed to meet this man. Mm. Not that I knew it at the time, but that was the way it was supposed to work out. I was supposed to have this guy in my life and learn the things I learned. Cause I got in touch with my spirituality. I would have never considered, you know, I was vulnerable for the first time. It was the first time I was in a relationship without gambling in the background. I always refer to gambling as my boyfriend. Like I had my boyfriend all those years, didn't talk back. I got to go on my terms, didn't have to worry about the drama. Um, it was, yeah. So that's kind of what's wow. happened. Wow. wow. Um, um, <laughs> are you I was speechless? Gonna, I was gonna... <laughs> yeah, I am a little bit speechless actually. Um, which, yeah, that's such an interesting, such an interesting story. I mean, I think, I can't speak for you, but in my experience, like stopping gambling is one thing, but then finding quote unquote, finding yourself is actually the, the next thing. And uh, that, that can be hard, right? Cause you've got to do, got to do a lot of like inward looking and, you know, um, and such like, so no, that sounds, that sounds really, really cool that you, that you met this guy. And um, it's, it's nice to hear that you're kind of still on good terms and, and such like, did, <laughs> Did it oh, we, we haven't been the whole time. Oh, okay. Like, that's <laughs> yeah. part of my, my, yeah. um, my recovery, like, and, and COVID. We'll be hearing again from Bobby shortly, but next up, we'll be hearing from Liz Riley and Jean Maleri, who work for Bet No More UK and the Peer Aid Service, respectively. Here's a bit more about them. Bet No More UK was established in 2013. Our charitable mission is to address gambling harms impacting on individuals, affected others, and UK communities. The lived experience of disruptive gambling behavior, addiction, and recovery is at the heart of our work. We are so grateful to those who donate their life narratives, time, and energy in order to help others. And this includes members of our management board, support staff, and volunteers, as well as those we seek to help. Our award-winning services are co-produced, meaning they combine the knowledge and insight provided by experts by experience with proven evidence-based approaches. Liz Riley is the Research and Evaluation Manager at Bet No More UK, and Jean Maleri is one of the coordinators on the Peer Aid Service. Hi, Liz and Jean. Thanks for joining me today. Let's get straight into it, if we may. So, Liz, you are running focus groups for women at the moment. Could you tell us a bit more about them and what you are learning? Yeah, of course. Um, the focus groups are for a research project that Bentley Moore started in January of this year. It's all about women's experiences of gambling support services. We've held six focus groups with women who are in recovery. And these women have been um, at different stages of their recovery, different age groups, different parts of the country. One was even from the Republic of Ireland, where there are next to no services for gamblers, let alone women gamblers. Um, we wanted our research to have a very practical focus. So three focus groups looked at women's lived experiences of support and treatment services. 
and another three focus groups looked at what support women would ideally like to be available to them. Understandably, there's no single experience of support services as all women are different. Some had additional problems such as mental or physical health issues, some had been gambling compulsively for decades and had lost homes, careers, relationships, everything, while others had been gambling in a harmful way just for a relatively short period of time. Um, some women then used a wide array of services over the years, putting together for themselves a whole package or, or strategy of support that ranged from residential rehab to weekly group meetings to one-to-one -one counselling. Um, one or two women just relied on blocking software and some inline, uh, some informal online support forums mm. but the majority had accessed some sort of formal service um, and the majority had accessed more than one service either because a particular service didn't work for them or because they needed lots of support over long periods of time. Um, it's probably good to say that in terms of services that are out there and that are just for women there's currently little, very little Gordon Moody is the most active in providing services for women. Um, it provides residential support and this year it's going to open a women's only um, residential centre. And many of the women in the focus groups had accessed their services and every woman who had said that they had been to Gordon Moody said that it was absolutely key to their recovery. The women said that when they hit rock bottom, they wanted to be taken away from their home environment where most of them gambled online to a safe place where they could be looked after for a while. The other women's service is Gamblers Anonymous Women Preferred Groups, which some women attended. So these two services are currently pretty much all that's on offer for women. And also, there are very few self-help resources out there that are just, just designed for women. While some women in the focus groups were adamant that they only wanted to access services just for women, many had kind of mixed and matched their approach. For example, attending some mixed GA groups and women-only groups or women-only groups and a counsellor who could be male. Experience of mixed sex support groups varied with some finding them to be intimidating or even just distracting. Mm -hmm. Some women felt that in a mixed group, they couldn't talk freely about some of the issues that triggered their gambling. I mean, that could be just like feeling rubbish because they'd just started their period. Or also they didn't want to talk about some of the historical drivers of their gambling, such as you know sexual abuse or abusive relationships. Whereas in a women-only environment, um, they felt better understood, less embarrassed, more supported. And women also found it really valuable to access services, services that were delivered by other women with lived experience, so long as these peers were properly trained. And again, that was all about being understood. Um, one thing that, is, that I think is really striking is how difficult it is for women to find appropriate support services. Mm. Some had approached their GPs and they were faced with you know, confusion at best and sometimes just outright dismissal by their doctors. Um, most women had at some stage or other just Googled it. You know, they Googled phrases such as help for women gamblers and then contacted whoever came up in their search. No one had a real mental map of the services out there, what each provider offers in general and for women in particular. So that meant that choice wasn't something that the women were actively exercising. They just went with whatever they could find at the time, though some of them did actively avoid local services because they were really frightened that they would be recognised by somebody they knew if they went somewhere very close to where they lived. Shame and stigma are acutely felt by women because they're meant to be the carers in our society, holding families together and not letting people down. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, the second group of focus groups looked at what women would ideally want. And thinking about that wish list for support and treatment services, they really want some sort of 
central physical or online place or hub where they can go to find out what's available to them. Either that or what they want is services, the service that they contact initially to tell them about all the other services that are out there. Mm. Cross referrals between services are really important as no one service can meet the needs of all women or men for that matter. Um, they want face-to-face -face services so that they can get that camaraderie, but they also want online services too because women have work, they have kids, they need the convenience of online services and it also brings them some more safety as well. Um, they want the option of women-only groups that are not those just organised by GA um, and which are led by women clinicians or trained support, uh, peer supporters. They also want one-to-one -one counselling. Um, and while all the women recognise that residential treatment programmes such as Gordon Moody can be difficult to access due to their responsibilities, they all recognise how important a residential programme can be at some stage during their recovery. They wanted more of it with shorter waiting times. They also want a national helpline that's 24 hours a day and that's really effective because women often gamble at home at night and in secret. Mm. Um, they also want their GPs to know more about gambling harms and where to signpost them and you know that's also true of other services like mental health services, social support services and Beyond the support to help them begin their recoveries, women also want extra support so that they can stay in recovery. And that means long-term aftercare, but also services that can help the, them rebuild their careers and their finances. And I think probably just to finish, the main thing that, want, that women want is hope. And they want that in the form of women role models who will speak freely and publicly about gambling harms um, in order to reduce the shame and stigma that women feel, but also to show that there is life after compulsive gambling in the shape of new relationships, new careers, better health, you know, more confidence. That's, that's mm. what they want in a nutshell. Mm. Thank you. So, so Jean, as a woman with lived experience of gambling, what are the main difference to struggles that men may have? Um, I think Liz has covered most of that, but for me and my own experience, I mean, I, I do believe men and women, we both have separate struggles through recovery. Um, but for me personally, it was a case of, I see that gambling was more what men would do, not females. Mm. But they've tailored it for women because you, the women's version of gambling, this is how I see it, was the online slots. So that's okay because you're allowed to do it. It's aimed at women. It's all pink, fluffy. You know, all the ladies do it, the advertising. It's all fun. You do it with your girlfriend. So, it, you know, that, that's okay. You can do it. But unfortunately for me, it did become a problem. Um, why didn't I get help? Um, the shame, stigma, uh, the embarrassment. Um, I, I have I failed as a mum, a partner, can't I cope? Why can't all these other women gamble okay and I can't? What, what's wrong with me? Um, I see it very much as my own problem then and I, I, I've got myself in this predicament. I'll get myself out of it. Obviously, I couldn't mm, do it. I needed mm. the help. Um, and then when you think, okay, then I, I've, you know, unfortunately I did hit my rock bottom. Let me go and get help. I went to my doctors and it was a case of, um, he said it's self-referral. So, you know, where am I getting this help from? Who can I reach out to? So I, I feel that the, the, the barriers that face you, if you do even try and get to that, getting the help, um, it, it wasn't there for me. Uh, for me personally, to, to know that there were other people, and as I said, not just the men, other women, the wrong models that are out there that, you know what, I had a gambling problem, I come through it, here's my story, would have been so inspirational to me that, wow, another woman's admitting that she's, she's not been able to cope. Not a failure, not at all, because it's mm -hmm. just an issue. It, it was an addiction that took hold of us and she had turned her life around. I would be like, wow, th that's given me hope. I know I can get through this. It's just a problem I had. And here's a support group that's available for me. GA, um, I'm sure it works for other people. I've never tried it, so I would never say, oh, it doesn't work. But the thought of going into a room 
full of men saying, hi, I'm Jean, I've got a gambling problem. And no, I couldn't think of anything worse. I would never want to do that. Mm-hmm. But if I thought that there was a women's group where it's going to be other women, I, I, I would have jumped at that chance 100%. So I, I do think definitely the... Uh, so the stigma around getting help that it's male orientated for gambling and I mean for me it was in 2015 things are totally different now you know um, on how gambling is you know literally everywhere you go it, it's not as um, kept on a low low as such should we say but that yeah the more help we can get out there the more women out there there, there are thousands hundreds of thousands of women out there so you know let's get our voices out there and get some uh, changes done for the uh, women nice one so um so a question to the both of you um i don't mind if, if liz you want to take this one what made you want to work in the charity sector and specifically within the problem gambling area I've, I've been a researcher for many years, but mainly doing academic research and also at the same time doing some voluntary work in the charity sector, fundraising for my local drug and alcohol service and working as a trainer in a prison for another charity. And I really wanted to bring these two things together and begin to do research that has a practical impact on people's lives. I began working at Bettner Moore in January of this year, and at that stage, I only had a really basic understanding of people's lived experiences or lived realities of, of gambling harms and of the way that the gambling operators work and their products, and then of the context of gambling policy. Um, and I've still got a lot to learn, but it's really rewarding begi- to begin to feed the findings of my work into Bet No More because it's a charity that really works on a solid evidence base. It's also rewarding to share the research with other organizations. For example, I was just contacted recently to make a contribution to a submission to the new women's health strategy um, being developed by the Department of Health and Social Care. You're really exploring how women's gambling harms are a public health issue. Above all, working with women with lived experience has just been hugely rewarding and humbling. Um, these women are rebuilding their lives you know, against all the odds, if you forgive the gambling mm. phrase. Nice one. Um, <clears throat> so, so, yeah, same question to you, uh, Jean. So, yeah, what made you want to work in the charity sector and specifically within the problem gambling area? Okay, so for me, it was, I found my recovery through Bet No More. So I was, you know, so grateful that someone had taken the time to help me, got me through my recovery, my, you know, literally got me out of my rock bottom. How could I give back? So I was given the opportunity to volunteer with Bet No More. Um, and I soon realised that by sharing my story and volunteering, I could help others. And I, I like that feeling that that felt good to me. Mm. So um, luckily, um, the more I done it, the more confidence I got. I le- was learning more things, and I realised that you know that there's not so many women at that time that were sharing their stories, and the feedback I was getting was just you know. A, a, overwhelming sometimes on women that were in tears because they were like thank you for sharing and I soon realized that by me just sharing my story I could help change impact on other people's lives and um, I was given the opportunity to work for Bet No More and I, I just grabbed it with both hands because I if I could save one person from being where I was I've achieved something and I'm a strong believer in turning a negative into a positive so that's why I work in this sector. The final question then, so as women working in this space, how do you hope your work will have an impact in the future? So just in terms of the actual focus groups, the findings of the research will have a really practical impact in so much as they're going to feed into Bet No More's women's service um, that will offer a a peer-led women's group and also some self-help resources that are designed specifically for women. Um, And also the findings of the research will be shared with other partners in this sector too. So hopefully it will have an impact on the services that they Mm. offer to women. Mm. In general though, um, I suppose I hope my work continues to have an impact upon service and treatment providers. So there's a positive impact on the lives of women and men affected by gambling harms. But I think above all, I'd like to 
contribute to a louder and better informed public conversation about harmful gambling so that maybe some of it can be prevented but also so that the shame and the stigma attached to it are reduced and men and women feel better able to come forward and just you know look for the help they need no for sure for sure and uh same question to you yourself there jean so how how do you hope your work will have uh, an impact in the future um i'd like to think that by me sharing my story talking you know on whatever platform that is that people hear you know where i've been what i've been through and that i've got through it and where i am today and it empowers them to reach out get help there's no shame there's no stigma and you know help as many people as we can moving forward brilliant thank you both for uh, for joining me today and uh, i wish you all the best for the future thank you thank you Bet No More's message is clear. Gambling should not compromise any aspect of your health and well-being. If what you've heard today has touched you, please take a look at our website, betnomoreuk.org, and follow our social media channels to have a look at what we do, at Bet no More and at Aid Peer on Twitter. If you have concerns around yours or someone else's gambling, please contact the National Gambling Treatment Service helpline that's open 24-7 on 0808 020-0133 for confidential advice and support. Without further ado, let's get back into part two of Bobby's story. So, so the terms of getting out of rehab were that I had to have aftercare treatment. Like that's one of the conditions that they'll let you out. So with me now moving, because now I have to go back and I have to move from Kansas City to New York for the job. Hmm. So they called ahead and there's this place here called Center for Problem Gambling. So that was who they committed to. They had an appointment my very first day at work. I was supposed to be there at night to meet them and go to group. And I'm like, well, I won't even have medical insurance. How am I going to pay for this? Well, that treatment was free too. So any obstacle I tried to do to get out of this stuff didn't work. So I start going to the center and uh, that, was, that was a big piece of my of my journey and then I went to GA here in New York too mm. but when when Brett and I broke up we started breaking up in um the summer of 2019 and again I was still trying to be a good human trying to keep him in my life I, you know I had my opinions about his his behaviors and stuff like the last time I saw him was the trip I was supposed to go to plan to move my whole life out there. And it was part of where my podcast came from was like, okay, when I move to Wisconsin, what am I going to do for work? I don't want to just go back. I want to work on this recovery stuff and I could podcast no matter where I was. So that was kind of where that was born. And, um, it took us until December where I finally just had enough and I stopped communicating with him but I didn't even tell him like, this is the last communication. I just went dark and it was around the holidays. And uh, he's like, Oh, I guess you're done talking to me. And we didn't speak again until June. Now he had, he had tried to kill himself too from gambling and suicide has been a, a hot topic. And that's something he tries to raise awareness on. Mm. And I had had an uncle that killed himself when he was four, when I was 14, he had, um, he had had AIDS and he was dating a girl that also was HIV positive and they broke up and he just thought that no one would ever love him again because of the AIDS. So he had killed himself. So I had this perspective on suicide as a survivor where Brett had it as so, like a survivor of someone else, you know, mm -hmm. where he had it more as, as the participant, the active participant. So he knew how he felt to drive him to that point and I viewed it kind of as like selfish, like how can you do that and leave people behind? Hmm. So it was always a conflict for us with that. Well, this past June, he was trying to help someone and the guy calls him and says, you know, hey, can you come out? So Brett goes out to the scene and the guy is recording it on YouTube, I guess, and kills himself in front of Brett. Oh, like, God. yeah. I can't, I just can't even imagine. So obviously no, no. when he reached out, I couldn't be like, I can't talk to you. Yeah, for so, sure. Um, so that's kind of how even, even our silence, like during our silence, 
I'm sorry if I'm getting depressing. During our, <laughs> during our silence, um, I, had, I had traveled to Thailand. You had mentioned Thailand too earlier. So I traveled to Thailand and Cambodia. This is like leading up to COVID. And we landed back in the States on February 1st. While I was in Cambodia, I got word that my grandmother on my biological side was, was sick and on her deathbed. And I was able to make a call to her. Um, I get back. It was a sober trip. I, I, had, I had booked the trip and the rule was you shouldn't drink for 30 days up until the trip. That was the ask of the, of mm. the guy. It was another podcaster, amazing person, put on retreats and stuff. Um, so I wasn't drinking. So then I came home and I was like, well, maybe I won't drink. I was too afraid I was going to drunk text Brett. I was scared of that because mm -hmm. um, I was still so charged with emotion. Now here we are. And the reason I'm, I'm telling you all this is because this is over two years, two and a half years without a bat dealing with this stuff. Right. Mm. And now you took away, I took away alcohol as one of my devices to get through this shit. So grandma was on her deathbed. I get home the first night I try to go out to a bar with music that I'm going to try to not drink alcohol. I get a text that my biological father, who I've been estranged with for 14 years died. And I'm next to Ken and I got to throw him his funeral the day before the world shut down with COVID. Oh, geez. While I'm trying to not drink, not gamble, get over the guy, like oh. you name it. So, so when I was telling you about podcasting to heal, mm. I processed all that stuff on the air, mm. like <laughs> every ounce of it. Um, so this last year has been really pivotal for who I've become and, mm. and how I feel about a lot of these things. But these were all the circumstances that kind of led me to yeah. here and now. For sure, for sure. Um, I was going to say, uh, it's interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, I used to record voice, mess voice notes to myself um, on my phone. And I lost my phone or, you know, the iCloud or wherever it takes it to. And um, I've just reconnected on the phone again. And I was like thinking, I was, I was kind of praying. I was like, I wonder if I've got these, these messages, these voice notes. Because since obviously I've started The Invisible Addiction, the podcast, I'm like, it'd be really interesting to go back to that time and to listen to what I was saying, like my, 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 my dialogue. Um, and I, I've, sure enough, I can access them. I've not listened to them yet, but I'm going to do it. And um, I'm not promising anything to anyone uh, but who knows, I might release some bits and pieces from it, but it's really interesting to hear what you've said. I mean, I can only imagine that's, that's helped you a lot, right? You know, sharing inner thoughts, your dialogue. Um, yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, I, I, I can't think for one minute what that must've been like that day before COVID kind of happens where everything kind of came to a head. Well, I'll tell you, I definitely through a funeral for him as if we weren't estranged and we had the best relationship. I did everything in my power to make sure that everybody that needed to make peace with it could. It's very complicated as far as all the kids involved and all that stuff and, and just me being the oldest. And what I tried to do, and I don't think I could have done this without recovery, to be honest. I don't think I would have had the strength or the patience or the tolerance um, or the respect for everybody's opinions. Cause there was one out of the five of us that actually wasn't just about anger. She actually had good memories of him and stuff. And there was four of us that were like the two brothers were filled with rage. Us two girls didn't know how to feel. Um, as I was progressing in my recovery, I was getting closer to where I didn't hate him anymore. I moved from like hate to neutral. And I think I was on my way to forgiveness. But I felt like I was grieving the loss of the opportunity because he was an addict. So how, if, if I think of addiction as an illness, why is there a double standard where I can hate him, but I don't want people to hate me and I'm an addict. Like there's a lot of things sure. to process. And um, I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel very passionately about if I see something on air and I'm like coaching my my audience or telling my audience this is the way you should act in this situation i feel like i have to set the example right i couldn't go out and drink or bet or whatever like i was accountable on a different level and i had to practice what i preached mm. so if someone else was in that spot i would have said go to your counselor go to group 
journal, call a friend, like all the things. And I literally documented all the things that I was doing and I got to the other side of it. So it's incredible. It's incredible. Cause am I right in saying there's, uh, I'm going to get this right. I hope I don't get this too wrong. It's like over, well over like 400 episodes or something like that. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, we're, we're, we're climbing to 500. So I had the two a day from March until I think I ended that in September and I went yeah. down to one a day plus my weekly interviews. So yeah, we're, we're getting close to 500. That's incredible. That's incredible. I'm like, if I can get to 50, I'm just like, <laughs> that would be amazing. But 500, that's, that's incredible. That's incredible. Um, so, I mean, you, you touched on sort of suicidal thoughts or was there an attempt to take your own life there? Or was this just like some real dark suicidal thoughts? I really like this question. Thank you for asking it. So I've come to just in the last, from talking about it the last few months, I think that my uncle that took his life probably saved mine and saved many more with the ripple effect, right? Because even Brett's philosophy now is different as someone who witnessed it or went through someone else completing suicide on his watch. So I can remember thinking if I was to kill myself, like I remember the strategy of making sure it didn't look like a suicide. So my life insurance would cover and all of that stuff. But I always had this, I couldn't do that to my mother because it was her brother. Right. Like, so I always, like, I really think that he saved my life knowing what that experience was like. I could never get there. And I had always had this, this, um, the story's in my head, right? Like I can, I can overcome this. It doesn't matter if I'm out of money, I'll just get another job. Like I had all those stories going on. So I'm not the traditional story. Did I have thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Cause it just gets so overwhelming. Like the mess, the mountain of the mess, <laughs> you know, the relationships, the isolation, the money, the debt, the, the lies, the mess. Yeah. Like it would be so much easier to kill ourselves than to deal with the mess. I feel like mm. it, it's a horrible thing to say, but it, that's what it is. It's an escape plan. So my own standards wouldn't allow me to do that. And then the impact of the survivors, like those are the two things that made it so that I don't think that was an option for me. Mm. So when you entered into like recovery um, post rehab, like what's the, so what are some of the things that you've done I know obviously you've shared numerous times on your podcast, but have you got any kind of tips and advice? What's helped you, you know, what your experience has been? Could you share with um, the Invisible Addiction podcast audience, you know, um, any tips and advice, uh, kind of maybe some do's and don'ts? I love this question too. That's a great one. And I should have asked you that when I interviewed you. So shame no, on I th me. I think, no, I think you did. I, I, well, I felt like you did. <laughs> I don't okay. know. Well, maybe we covered it. So one of the biggest foundations of the 321 brand, and this is something that I learned a lot about, is self-care. Taking care of our mental wellness, our health, those kinds of things. Putting ourselves first, because we're no good. You know, the whole oxygen mask analogy. But really going on that adventure and being very mindful of it and expressing gratitude and doing all those things. So that's one of the biggest pieces. And, and spirituality, whatever that looks like to people, I truly believe this, the, my journey with spirituality was like non-existent. And Brett said to me one day, and this is where it changed for me. Well, two things. He made the statement and then I was doing my step work. So step 11 is thought through prayer and spirituality, um, prayer and meditation. So I was like, okay, I got to learn how to meditate because I took it very literal, you know, like this mm -hmm. is the work I got to do. And he had said to me when he was gambling, he didn't want to go to church because he felt like he didn't deserve to go to church. And I was like, what do you mean deserve to go to church? Like I could not grasp that. Well, if this is something that people deserve to do. I need to go check this out. So it was like a motivation, like I was missing something. So I still am not comfortable saying God. Like I call it the G word. It's not my thing. I respect it being other people's things. And why I'm bringing this up, because I think 
through my journey where I landed and, and I call it the universe or love source is another word that I, I really like. Um, I believe now that I can look back at every single thing that happened along the way, all this drama that I just told you about, all this shit, the bad relationship, the everything. I believe it all led me to be in this moment right here, right now, to give me all of that experience. I feel that I've been handpicked to do my mission. Like what I imagine my, my buildings looking like and the kind of impact I can have, it's clear as day in my mind. And, and it's my mind and it took all of this to get here. Um, so investigating that, meditating, going to church, doing the things to figure it out. Mm. And I'm not saying this for a, someone who stopped gambling yesterday. I'm not saying that you're going to solve all this, right? This is, this is my journey. And the one thing I love is that we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. That's the other reason I love documenting it on the podcast. I can't wait to listen three years from now, five years from now and be like, oh, like what you were saying with your voice memos. Um, so the self-care and spirituality would be my two biggest recommendations with, with gratitude. Uh, and I'm also a believer. This is very uh, cliche in the recovery community. The opposite of addiction is connection. 100%. And, and, and you just, you just got to, you just got to stay connected. We're going through something right now with somebody in our community. Um, he stopped going to Wednesday night meetings intentionally. He didn't like something to happen. So he pulled back. Now today he just left our chat and I'm like, this is not good. He's going to relapse. I truly believe that because he's disconnecting. Whether he knows it on a subconscious level or not, I, I believe that he's going to go back if he doesn't start re-engaging in a way, whether you like it or not, that's, that's, I call it attitude. So change your attic to, to gratitude. So when you start pulling away and you didn't get your way and you have this little negative nilly and it's ego running your life, right? Like he didn't like some stuff that happened in a meeting. It was ego related. It, it had nothing to do with it. So his addictions winning over his recovery mind in that case. Oh, well, I didn't get my way. I'm going to go do what I want to do. And that's, that's how I see it. And that means the addictions bubbling back up. And it's, I've seen it over and over again. I could almost smell a relapse coming. It's, mm. it's disturbing. That's so interesting. So interesting. I really like that analogy that you've just used there. Um, I was going to just quickly mention as well, like for me, spiritual, spirituality, I can't even get my words out. Come on, I'm doing a podcast. I can't even speak properly. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, your spiritual side, like for me, I don't know if it's called depression. I don't know if it's like searching for God, searching for meaning searching for who I am, soul searching, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's no exaggeration to say that I thought about death a lot, a lot to the point where I was like, I'm not scared of it anymore. Like I'm, I'm not, I, I can do this, you know? Um, and it, it sounds kind of cliche, but it was like going to the pit, the bottom of the bottom of the lowest, the lowest point you could get. I mean, at, at, at times, I mean, when I was living back home with my parents, like I valued my dog more than I valued myself. Like I thought, oh, my parents like the dog more than me and all this sort of really weird internal stuff. Um, but yeah, kind of on my path of recovery, as it were, I would kind of go to bed sometimes and there was a, another chap's death, a, a Martin, my friend who had an overdose. But like that, that was a real kind of turning point for me as well. And I was going to sound a bit woo-woo, but yeah, like sometimes I'm not saying I can speak to them or see them, but they kind of come, they appear in my mind, these people, um, and their spirit lives on. And I don't know, as I say, if it is God or if it's a higher power or if there is the, like you say, the universe, the love source, whatever, I don't know. But um, for me, that was a massive turning point. And I don't know if, I don't know if gambling took me to that point, um, but I, I'm, I'm almost at this point where it's kind of, I'm almost grateful in a way. I know it sounds a bit twisted. Like I'm grateful that everything's happened to me. Like all the gambling, I'm grateful for that. Cause now, I've, like you say, I've got all this experience behind me and um, everything's a lot, you know, it's crystal clear in my mind. So I can totally relate to everything you've just said. Did you have, here I am going back to you, but did you have a relationship like with religion or God or any of that stuff before your gambling addiction? No, no. So, I mean, I was, I was christened as a, as a child. 
Um, but we never went to church, like very rarely. Um, so, I mean, what was interesting, like last year, I got a job, a part-time job at a secondary school that's a, a Catholic school. And I was like, oh my goodness. I even said like, I'm not, I'm not Christian at all. They're like, it's okay. But um, that really helped my recovery as well. The fact that, um, you know, it, by the way, it wasn't like a strict religious Catholic school, you know, but um, it was uh, that, that really like underpinned everything. And that the community, like you say, the connection for me, that was, that was just incredible. Having routine, having a regular wake up time, regular bedtime, all these, all this stuff that you would just take for granted that I didn't have pre previous. So right. that was a massive uh, sort of step in my recovery as well. So I don't know if anyone will be listening from the school, <laughs> but if they are, <laughs> you guys rock. Yeah. Routine is crucial. So mm. crucial. And I think sometimes I, I, I guess this is why it's been so easy to chat with you this my morning your afternoon is because we are aligned in a lot of these fundamental thinkings. Um, mm. I almost sometimes feel like survivors of addiction almost get a better shot at the true meaning of life, whatever that is, or true happiness or wholeness, because it leads us to those solutions and feeling that amazement and gratitude and all that, right? Like if, if you didn't have an addiction and you're just bebopping through life and nothing's truly broken and you never have to truly dig or you never, like you, it's, you're just in neutral the whole time. Mm. Where us, like we're going backwards the whole time. So we gotta figure out how to change the whole engine and start going forward. So I think it's, we're very gifted in that sense. Mm, I would agree. I would agree. I would agree. I'm, I'm, yeah, like I say, I'm grateful for that. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, my girlfriend probably gets sick to death of me. I'm, I'm like, oh, it's like a really nice day. I don't know if that's just being polite or being British. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Oh, isn't this, oh, isn't it so sunny? Um, but yeah, I mean, I just get kicks out of little things in life now. It's just like, right, we'll go for a nice walk. Oh, that was amazing. You know, or go back to my parents' house, go for a big run. Oh, I really like the scenery. And I don't know. It's just the little things. It's the little things. Um, it is. So, so look, what, what's life, what, what's life been like for you since, you know, what's an average day in the life? Tell us what you've been up to now. Cause the three, two, one, no kidding podcast is taking you elsewhere, isn't it? Into other spheres, like you say. So, yeah, it, it's funny. I started my whole life. I said, I never want to be an entrepreneur. Never. I want the comfort of a nice, cozy corporate job and uh, medical insurance and all the things. Right. Well, I while I was doing my job, I, I'm trying to launch the three to one stuff, which is about raising awareness for gambling. I go to like um, recovery conferences when they were still real and, and virtual ones and I'm trying to get educated and I'm a big mouth. I'm a leader. I'm a, I'm a good example. I'm outspoken. Like all those attributes are good for my messaging. And I was still working the corporate job and I had to hire VAs to help me with technology and social media and all the things that you need to do that I was pushing on doing. I didn't really want to do. V um, v VA being a virtual assistant. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, vir virtual assistants. And um, I was going through so much coaching and personal development. And it was like they were trying to, t to tell me to be a coach as a career, which doesn't really, I do it almost for free anyway, like all the time, which is fine. It's, it's something, again, that's in my skill set. And I'm fortunate for that. But what ended up happening through all this online learning and <laughs> networking is I realized that I had so much experience with staffing and hiring and all this stuff. And my, my now business partner, she was my lead virtual assistant to start with. When I brought my team on, I had five or six people and I didn't tell you this in quite as much detail before, but I bring them into a zoom room and I want to run all these independent contractors as an organization. I want them on my three, two, one team. We have to communicate. Here's the why. So I tell them all about, three, two, one. And I want these recovery playgrounds and I want to change the laws. Cause, cause that's the other thing you need money and influence in order to do things. I didn't have money and influence. So I'm trying to teach myself how to get money and influence. That's what's happening right now. So I tell them the why is so we can 
change the laws, get the kids educated, you know, about the arcades. I want messaging on the back of raffle tickets. I, I want all these things. I want treatment. So I know I need money and influence. So I tell them all this stuff, all my dreams. This is why you need to work hard for me, essentially. This is why it's important that we convey this message. So as these entrepreneurs are coming to me asking for where I got my virtual assistance from, I, I meet with my um, partner. Her name is Anna. I meet with her every Monday and, or Sunday and, and Thursday. And on one of the meetings, I had referred somebody to her. She goes, Bobby, do you want to know my dream? Because that was essentially what I did. I told the team my dream. I said, sure. She goes, well, I want to help more virtual assistants here in the Philippines get work from home jobs. I said, oh, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So like literally this conversation happened in August. September was the first time we went public looking for clients. We now have between who pays us weekly and who we've met with and onboarded. We have close to 100 clients that we've wow. been in contact with. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're up to over 20 virtual assistants. Um, it's That's just cool. Going. That's awesome. So now not only do I get to everybody that knows me gets to hear the gambling awareness message, but then I also am coming in contact with more people and I get to help entrepreneurs in the business space as well, which I get excited about. I've never seen myself as like the social worker counselor type. Like I'm not, my counselor tells me that I'm empathetic, but Sometimes I wonder, I don't have a lot of patience. I'm, I believe in like the hard work and the honest and direct approach mm. where some people are just more touchy feely and all that. And I, I've never felt that touchy feely. Like, like if, if you and I were in therapy and I was your therapist and I thought you were dragging your feet or something, I would be like, Alex, not the <laughs> bullshit. Like, who, who do you think you're kidding? Yeah. So I just knew that was never my road. So the VA business keeps me connected to business and helping people all at the same time. That's incredible. That's incredible. So is it called 321? I mean, is it coming under the umbrella of 321? No kidding? No. Oh. So 321, no kidding. 321 mm. is my clean date. And ah, okay, right. Which I, I have a tattoo on my ankle, so I can't ever go get back to gambling. I have the 321 logo <laughs> on, my, on my, my body. Um, and then the no kidding is these recovery playgrounds that I'm going to build. Children aren't allowed in. So it's no kid in my Fair building. Enough. I get it. Tell, so, tell us, tell us more about that. Tell us more about the playground. Cause we, we, we briefly touched on it like earlier, didn't we? But tell us more, tell us more. Well, I can, this one I could talk about for days. So my vision is there's no, if you quit gambling and you want to go out for entertainment, you can go to a bar. Like I see a lot of cross addiction is, is part of the problem. Like even in my story, I haven't drank in over a year now. I, I haven't gone back, but I'm, I haven't declared myself an alcoholic yet. I just feel like it's contradictive to mm. my journey. So initially when I started thinking about three, two, one, it was no gambling and no children. I've never had kids. And I'm the person that's always stuck next to the screaming baby on the plane um, or like they're in my way. So the essence of this mission it started when I was married. My husband was like a big kid. He used to play with the kids. And when he was turning 50, I wanted to have a slip and slide and kid activities, but no kids so that adults could be kids. So it's been brewing and bubbling up. And then I wasn't with them for his 50th birthday. So I didn't get to do that. So then I'm at a Zumba convention and we're standing in line in a water slide and there's kids in front of us. And I was like, I don't want a place to go where there's no kids. Like I want to be the front of the line. I didn't make babies. I shouldn't have to pay taxes on them. I shouldn't have to wait in public. So that's where the no kid in part comes. That's just me <laughs> personally. But when you think of someone who's trying to recover from alcohol, for example, if they want to be on a dart league or a pool league, they have to go to a bar. So there's all these places that the addiction, just walking into a convenience store, there's scratch offs for the gambler. Like there's nowhere to go where there's no kids, no gambling and no alcohol. So this empire that it's going to be because it's going to be multiple locations um it's going to have everything from self-care activities like a yoga studio and meditation and zumba it's going to have fun things like roller skating finger painting and um you know just kid activities i'm actually thinking the entrance i got to work with an architect on this but like at the entrance i want to be the slide into a ball pit <laughs> that's so cool yeah so yeah so I want a safe place for people in the recovery community to go. 
in, in addition to anniversary and birthday desserts, I want there to be clean time desserts. I want there to be, I love animals. So I want there to be um, the two dogs that I don't have yet, whose names are gonna be um, Serenity and Serendipity. Um, I want them to have a station where my people can come in and get selfies with the dogs <laughs> and they leave with a magnet, but they pay extra money for it and the money goes to animal charity. I want there to be a quiet space for um, people to be able to talk. 12-step people can have rooms or recovery. All these things, sober weddings. Um, it's going to be huge. Like, I want to have concerts. I want to have trivia night. It's going to be like an all-in-one it's just a, playground. It's like, a, it's like a new world, like, like, a, like a, you know, a brave new world. or a, What's the word? Dystopian? Utopian future? I don't know. You know, like yeah. a, a modern, modern world, you know. It's, it's an incredible vision. Yeah, I can't, I can't find anything like it. And things that are important in my recovery are Zumba, you know, going for walks. So I take pictures. I still have the floral part of me. So I take pictures of all this, the floral and the landscape. So I, I picture those pictures being framed on my wall. I picture all the podcasts that influenced me being framed on the wall. Um, Blue October oh, does my... Have you, are you familiar with them? No, I don't know what blue. No, no, I don't know what that is. They're a group. You need to listen to their music. Oh, um, hang on a minute. Oh, okay. I don't know them, but there was a band at school called Red November. <laughs> oh, that's yes. funny. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. Well, Blue October, I never heard of. And when I was involved with Brett, he's like, this is my boyfriend. And I'm like, but the guy is eight over eight years now away from the lead singer over away from um, alcohol. And he had a very crazy journey too. did a documentary, but I love their music and they have a song called, I hope you're happy. And I wanted to use it for my podcast and I couldn't figure out how to do it. So we bought concert tickets and me and my 16 year old niece bought a meet and greet, asked them if we can use the music for the podcast. He said, yes. Um, rocks. And yeah, it, nice. Yeah, it's like one of the foundational things. So I'm going to have like a blue October room where it plays just his music. The Zumba room will have a Latin flavor with food. So it's all about my personality and my recovery coming to life in a way that other people can experience it. And normal people that aren't addicts can come too that just need a break from their kids or whatever. It'll be like a, a, a cover charge and you can do whatever activities you want instead of all this nickel and diming people. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, you've got a customer. I'd, I mean, I I'd, I'd, I'd would make a trip. I, I would take a holiday out to come to come across. So it's going to be what, based in like New York or all over, you know? Well, I plan on, I want three or four corporate stores in locations that are important to me. Like I'd have a Northeast one so I could see my family. Kansas City is going to be my flagship store where I'm going to build like an apartment above it. I plan on buying an RV in the spring and i'm going to travel around the country finding the locations that are ideal and looking for real estate and stuff mm -hmm. um and then when they're under construction i could drive the rv and, and bounce around and save on airfare and all that stuff i'm still like very cheap um but i want them kansas city denver and eventually franchise them so then mm -hmm. they could be wherever like i don't want to go to chicago it's cold in chicago um I would like to make it international. And I also, the long term, once that's all successful, I want like a Disneyland of recovery. So in, in the initial buildings, um, you know, it's gonna be floors and not everything's gonna be massive. Well, I want like a retreat center where all the activities that are in my three, two, ones are now separate building. So you, so you can go and just be there for like a week or two weeks and you have cabins to sleep and you can do all my activities in one place. It sort of almost sounds too good to be true. I'm like, come on, like, where, where's the catch? Where, where's the catch? You know, I'm just, yeah, it's. Uh... Oh, oh, I forgot to tell you the best part. So there's all this. My staff, I want halfway houses. I don't know if you know that term, but out back or on the property, I want a home where people in recovery and people who don't have homes have shelter and they can work there. They're my employees. So they have shelter and income and food and, and everything is right there. They become part of my team and they can rebuild their lives and they're right on site. They'll have requirements, they'll have to lead meetings, they'll have to be clean, all the things, but they'll have a whole new chance to do what they need to do. Wow, wow, sounds inspiring, sounds inspiring. So, so Bobby, I mean, before we wrap things up, um, is there anything else that you'd like to kind of mention? Um, 
or oh what well, there is one thing i saw on your website the 30 day give up challenge can you tell us more about that for i guess that's for people struggling with gambling problems so you did your homework so the 30 day give up gambling challenge i'm very impressed by you and i'm embarrassed i didn't do as much homework as you did um <laughs> Oh, but it's kind of fun learning on the fly too. So I, I enjoyed our interview. So Me too. I did a 30 day book writing challenge uh, back in May. And the, and the concept is you get an email every day with instructions on how to do stuff. So that's what the give up gambling challenge is. For that person who isn't ready to walk into a meeting, isn't to say out loud what they want to do. Um, it's to give them some exposure to gambling in the comfort of their own home, you know, to, to recovery and see what their options are and like get their journey started. I haven't, I haven't blown it up because it, it would sell for like a hundred dollars. And I, I got, I had stories in my head, like, well, if someone's looking to quit, they're not going to have the hundred dollars to spend on it. It was, it was to help generate income to go towards the construction of the buildings, right? Yeah. Like, all the money, I don't care about the money for me. All the money has to go towards the business. That's what I'm trying to figure out how to make the most money. Mm. Um, so that was one of the products, which is another relief of the virtual assistant business coming in handy. I can make income and not have to tap into the folks that are struggling financially. Yeah, that's, I was going to say the, the virtual assistant like um, business sounds amazing because like you, when you just described about taking the RV around the country, the great thing is you can record a podcast anywhere in the world and you could be running your business anywhere in the world like that that for me is is surely got to be the dream that's that's what i want to do you know going forward um well you know. you're gonna meet me in person someday alex i'm pretty sure because one of my like there's me and anna that are partners but we have a fellow james that's right there in the uk with you mm. um that i will be there we will be there visiting him he's on our team so who knows we'll be doing lunch or something Let's do it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I love this. This is amazing. Well, look, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, where can people find you online? The easiest way is since we've talked a lot about three, two, one, no kidding, you'll find Facebook and well, you'll see it's either three, two, one, no kidding or Bobby the awesome um, is become the overarching brand. Cause it got really confusing gambling VAs. How do these matter? So, uh, Bobby, the awesome is going to be the overarching band. So if you typed in Bobby, the awesome, you'll find me on Instagram. You'll find me on, um, Facebook. Yeah, I'm all over. That would be the easiest way. I'll send you some links if you want, if that'll help. Uh, but, but yeah, Bobby, the awesome or three, two, one, three, two, one, no kidding is a very unique name. <laughs> yeah. I like it. I like it. It really stands out. It really stands out. So Bobby, thank you so much for coming on the Invisible Addiction podcast and sharing your story. It has been awesome. It has been awesome. Thank you for allowing me. It's been such a pleasure getting to know you today. Oh, it's been brilliant. It's been brilliant. Well, look, take care and uh, I'll speak to you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Alex. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. How did you relate to Bobby's story? Did you feel like you had an intimate personal relationship with gambling have you experienced problems with alcohol perhaps you've got ambitions now to succeed in business and fulfill your potential let me know let's start a conversation feel free to drop me a comment on youtube message on social media or get in touch with me confidentially via email info at the addiction.com in the next episode, I'll be speaking to Brian Hatch, founder and host of All In, the Addicted Gamblers podcast. I am massively looking forward to that one. We get in at the deep end. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. Finally, I'd like to say a massive thank you to the sponsors of this episode, Talk Band Stop and Bet No More UK. Talk Band Stop is a partnership that combines practical tools with support to help you stop gambling and kickstart your recovery journey. It all starts with a chat. Bet No More UK are a charity helping people take back control of their life from gambling. Bet No More UK was established by individuals with lived experience of gambling harms who now use that insight and knowledge to help others. Massive thanks to the both of them. In the meantime, thanks once again, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care and I'll speak to you soon.